This is part two of the Wobblies and Blankets Disc PowerPoint. This is a British Columbia coal mining camp. Um, obviously, it is not the mine. Uh, I wanted to show you this particular image for a couple of reasons. Right? So first of all, in this image, you can see one of the most important people in a work camp, whether it was a railroad construction camp, uh, a mining camp, uh, a forestry camp, uh, or uh, a harvesting farm camp. Um, he's the guy wearing the apron, kind of in the middle of the image. Anybody want to guess what his job might be? He's the camp cook, right? Camping for, uh, cooking for these work camps was a particularly interesting job, right? You can tell um, from the setting here, there's trees all around, okay? So um, this would have been um, a pretty rustic area, a pretty remote area. This was not near a city at all. Um, so the, the meals that were made for the workers had to power them through the work. And um, not every group ate together. We'll talk uh, about um, the segregation in a few minutes. Um, but uh, this house behind the gentleman here um, would have been where the cook lived. It was probably also where a number of chickens and pigs, um, possibly goats, uh, etc., lived. Because any of the meat that they needed to serve, they had to bring with them. And this is a period before freezers, right? Uh, before fridges, before electricity. So any um, of the meat had to come as animals. And you couldn't leave animals outside in the woods at night because the wolves, the coyotes, etc., will get them. So um, this gentleman, the cook, um, would have gotten better accommodations than many of the other workers. Um, however, he would have had to share them um, with some of the critters that would eventually become meat. Right? Um, so this is actually a pretty glamorous uh, cabin for uh, a work camp. Right? It's a, a classic log cabin there, um, and, uh, and it's bigger um, than the accommodations that a lot of the men would have, like I said. Uh, this gentleman, the cook, was an important guy. So segregation and ethnic stratification were an important part of how uh, life worked in railroad construction camps in this period of history. So you will remember from our earlier uh, concepts, uh, segregation um, is when groups are separated, when they live, work, socialize, etc., separately. Ethnic stratification is the way that some groups have more power and resources than other groups in a culture. And in the Isidu reading, um, Isidu talks about how the British um, remain at the top of the ethnic stratification system from 1759 uh, until today. It, so the camps, the work camps, were segregated by ethnicity. Your ethnic identity, whether you were uh, British, Irish, um, Eastern European or Italian or Chinese determined your status and your role in Canadian society. And on frontier jobs, the isolation made this uh, process of segregation and stratification even more brutal. Because they were far away from most large settlements and cities, and because they were constantly moving, many of these workers, the blanket stiffs, kept their cultural practices. So the Italians um, ate uh, traditional Italian food. Um, many of the Ukrainians continued to wear their traditional Eastern European peasant costumes, etc. This isolation slowed their assimilation. And then the spatial segregation in the camps also um, prevented them from doing things like learning English, uh, etc. So the camps were separated into white men, and the white men got the best accommodations as well as the best jobs, and we'll talk about that later, um, and foreigners. And the foreigners were kept together, so the Italians were kept together, the Eastern Europeans were kept together, the Chinese were kept together. Um, and uh, this emphasized ethnic boundaries that carried over into the ethnic stratification in the jobs. So Eastern and Southern Europeans, so uh, Ukrainians, um, uh, Hungarians, uh, Polish folks, uh, Russians, etc., um, were considered, and Italians and the odd Portuguese person, um, were considered by the bosses to be not very smart, um, to be um, docile or easy to push around, um, and to be obedient. So they were given the most manual and menial and dangerous jobs. 
right? So um, they were given the jobs of muckers, which is basically the things that we would have bulldozers and diggers do today. So excavation, it was work, unskilled work that involved lots of backbreaking um, use of picks and shovels. Um, the good jobs, like the folks uh, who worked uh, laying track, um, were these jobs were less isolated. Um, they were involved higher pay. They were less um, manually challenging and dirty. These jobs were reserved for uh, white men. So that basically means the British, the French, and the Scandinavians. So this image dates from 1897. It's a Yukon Railroad camp. Yukon um, is the northern uh, Canadian territory above British Columbia. Um, and uh, it's the BC uh, Railroad line, the BC Yukon line. Um, and this is late October, right? It is the very beginning of winter. Okay, now in the image, you can see these many, many, many wagons and teams of horses. Okay, so, and you'll notice they're double teams, so the wagons are going to be carrying a lot of weight. Um, the men who drive these wagons are called Teamsters, right? Um, and the reason for these wagons is this railroad camp is about to be shut down. Uh, railroad construction could not proceed through the winter in the Yukon because of permafrost and the incredibly low temperatures and harsh weather. Right? So um, these wagons are going to be filled with uh, the equipment and the men that have been building the railroad and they're all going to go south. Right? This is again in the lack of heavy equipment uh, in a time when we didn't have paved roads. Right? Uh, this is how things were moved around. Now I want to call your attention not just to the, the wagon teams in the foreground here, but look in the background. I want you to notice the buildings, all right? So in the background to the left, there's a very big canvas tent that's got um, a sort of log cabin base to it. That tent would have been the mess tent. That would have been the food tent, all right? Um, and uh, you can see it was really big because it was a really big workforce, all right? Now behind that, um, pretty much in the center of the, the picture, you can see a, a wood cabin. That cabin was very likely the foreman and the supervisors, right? Because it's actually a construction. Now, next to it, sort of in the right, to the right of it, uh, you'll see a tent that again has kind of like a wood frame at the bottom. That was probably um, workers who were considered white men. Right? And then behind that, you can see a bunch more tents. And if you could see them more closely, you would see that they get more and more flimsy. Um, the ones that are the furthest back there uh, were very probably either Italian or Chinese workers. Um, the ones slightly closer would have been Eastern European workers. This is a good illustration of how the camps were segregated. Right. So um, the the foreman and the bosses got uh, decent accommodations. Um, the white men got less horrible accommodations and it sort of got worse and worse, depending on how far down the ethnic stratification system the workers were. OK. So the living conditions in the construction camps were terrible. All right. They were just awful. Um, the camps were built only to make basic needs during the construction contract. And the companies um, that were building the railroad, they skimped on building materials and maintenance to save money, right? To get the highest profits that they possibly could. So they were incredibly inadequate housing. Um, the good ones were built of logs, but were completely uninsulated. Sometimes the men lived in old boxcars. Um, and something the size of a train boxcar would be used to house 50 to 60 men. These men slept in double bunks. Um, so when you see bunk beds at Ikea, you see bunk beds where you get in on the side, right? Um, but the bunks that these men slept in were what they call muzzle loaded. So you get in at the end um, and they would have been right next to each other. All right. So if the guy next to you has lice, you're going to have lice uh, within two days. If the guy next to you has diarrhea, you're going to know, all right? Um, the workers didn't even get given mattresses. They had to buy hay um, and they would stuff the hay um, in the beds to be their mattresses. Um, most of the bunk houses only had uh, two very small windows, um, which were often just left open, um, like they didn't have glass in them, um, for ventilation. Um, and so the bunks were dark and stuffy. And imagine, so these men don't have showers, right? They work hard all day, they're filthy, they're sweaty. Right? There's no showers. Imagine what those bunkhouses smelled like. Right? Um, so they, of course, um, gathered pests. 
Um, and uh, anything that one worker had, whether it was pests or sickness, every worker eventually had. Um, a BC health officer reported um, in his report on one work camp that the sanitary arrangements are nil. What he means by that is there's no bathrooms, all right? So previous to my visit, the closet, he means the outhouse, is a very polite British way of saying outhouse, was closed because of its wrong location and want of proper construction. So it was in the wrong place and it was badly built. Um, and because there was no outhouse, um, the gentlemen were just going to the bathroom on the ground. So he says, as a result, the ground was filthy. Um, you can't do that. All right. Anybody who camps at all knows this. Um, you can't just um, go to the bathroom wherever you want. Um, if you do that, the water ends up contam contaminated. Right. So um, often the camps had contaminated water and typhoid fever, the kind of uh, illness that you get when you drink uh, contaminated water um, was uh, really common in the camps. So the foreigners, so the Chinese, the Italians, the Eastern Europeans, lived in the most uh, nasty accommodations and they suffered the worst from typhoid. The contractors knew that the camps were uh, horrific um, and they did nothing about it. They ignored the provincial health standards, they ignored building codes, etc. They just did whatever they wanted. I wanted to show you some of that boxcar housing. So here we have uh, a photograph um, of uh, a railroad line built. You can see on the very left, you can see a guy standing on it. So you can see that it's actually built. Um, and this is some of the workers housing here. So you've got um, this first boxcar here. It's got a guy hanging out the window and it's got a smokestack. So it probably had a wood stove in it, which makes it glamorous compared to many accommodations. Um, uh, more gentlemen would have lived in the next boxcar there. Someone has pitched a tent on the top, which was actually a really good idea. I would much rather be in a tent on the top than in the bunkhouse itself. All right, and you can see all of these men probably lived in what looks like three uh, bunk cars here, right? So this is pretty much the, the way that, uh, that railroad construction camps worked if there wasn't tents or housing built uh, on the ground. So living conditions are terrible. What about the wages? So the wages were low. They were incredibly low. Um, just like we pay service sector wages, uh, service sector workers really uh, very little these days. Um, these workers were paid very little, right? The wages depended partly on where they were working. It partly depended which year it was, and it partly depended on your ethnicity. White workers made much more money um, than the workers who weren't considered white. So in 1907, an immigration inspector reported the daily wages of $2 per day in a New Brunswick camp and $2.50 in Quebec. In 1911, when there was a flooded labor market, contractors lowered the pay um, uh, on the railroad from $2.75 to $2.25. So a flooded labor market is when there are more uh, workers who want jobs then there are jobs available. And uh, one of the, the things that Sifton's immigration policy did, one of the things that uh, allowing companies to recruit workers um, and bring them here did, was keep the labor market flooded. Um, it was more flooded sometimes and less flooded other times, um, but it was a, a, a labor market that gave bosses a really big advantage um, because it's difficult to stand up for yourself and your rights on a job when you know there are six guys standing outside waiting for your job, okay? So uh, men who are considered white, so again, that's British, French, and Scandinavian, um, were considered uh, better and paid better than other workers. So uh, historians estimate the day rates and Ukrainians, um, the day rates for Italians and Ukrainians were well below $2 a day. Okay. The blanket stiff low wage position was maintained by macroeconomic factors such as inflation and immigration policies that deliberately flooded the labor markets. It was also maintained by a practice uh, that the companies used of um, giving immigrants jobs because they were in debt for the company um, for their transportation to the work site. So one of the things about these deals that were struck between steamship companies and railroad companies, say you took the Canadian Pacific Lines steamship and the employment agent who talked you into coming to Canada told you, oh, don't worry, we'll cover your fare. We'll cover your fare. It's covered. You don't need to worry about it. You'll just work it off when you get to Canada. All right. Um, and so you'd arrive in the port in Halifax on the Canadian Pacific Line steamship um, and another immigration agent or employment agent um, would have identified all of the folks 
who had uh, not paid their fare and they would be loaded directly into a boxcar on a train and the train would take them to a railroad construction site where they were expected to begin work. Um, and they were considered uh, in debt to the company. So they, they had to work to pay off their steamship fare to get to Canada. This debt, however, didn't get paid off, it increased. All right, so workers had to pay board for living in those crappy uh, tents or, or um, sheds. Um, they were charged various fees by the boss for just about anything and everything. Um, and because they were in these isolated areas, the only places that they could get consumer goods was at stores that the company owned, right? And so if a shovel was $6 in Calgary, Right. Um, if you tried to buy it at the Canadian Pacific Railroad store, um, it was uh, twenty dollars. OK, so it was only after a lot of weeks of work that many of the blanket stiffs actually began to make any money. So McCormick cites examples of men being paid 25 cents for two weeks work on a railroad construction site or 65 cents for six weeks work in northern Ontario. So it's kind of like credit cards, only a little worse. Uh, I wanted to show you um, some uh, another example of segregation. So uh, this is Cumberland, um, which is a, a town in uh, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. It's a very pretty area. Um, in, uh, and it was a, a big mining town, right? That was kind of how it got its start. Now, in many of these resource towns um, in British Columbia and other places, um, Chinese folks were not allowed to settle um, in the main part of town. They weren't allowed to buy land in the main part of town. Um, and so what would happen is they would, uh, the, the first couple of Chinese who got to the community would buy some land on the outskirts of town and then other Chinese workers um, would end up settling there as well or buying land there as well. And so you had um, the main town like Cumberland, right? And then you would have a Chinatown section of Cumberland. So this is the Chinatown section, right? So you can see, first of all, it's quite large, right? It is not a small chunk of town because there were a lot of Chinese workers um, working the railroads, the mines, forestry, etc., right? Um, the Chinatown part of many towns um, was where um, sex workers would work. Uh, it was where opium dens would be set up. Um, there were restaurants, general stores, laundries, um, uh, but it was often sort of the seedier part of town. Okay, um, uh, not because uh, there's anything wrong with Chinese people, but because um, Chinese people were considered not acceptable and not respectable, and so things that were not acceptable and not respectable kind of ended up in Chinatown. All right. Uh, so this is um, one Chinatown in a small town in BC. We've talked about wages, we've talked about living conditions. Now I want to talk about working conditions more generally. All right, so before we talk about Wobblies and Blanket Stiff's working conditions, I want to run through what working conditions are. So working conditions are incredibly important. Those of you who are working or who have had jobs, you know this because in your job, they are the things that make a job a good job or a bad job, right? I'm going to list some basic things that are your working conditions. So your pay, your wage, is a, a really important working condition. It's the one that most of us ask about first. How much does this job pay, right? Um, and there are some particular issues around pay, right? So if you have to spend time doing prep for work, um, like most teachers do, um, like sleeping car porters had to, uh, et cetera, um, then you want to know if you're going to be paid for your preparation time. Okay, so it's one of the things that's great about being full-time for me is I get paid for preparation time. Many of your part-time teachers are only paid um, for the time when they are actually teaching, right? Um, overtime is another pay issue, right? So if you're working more hours in the week than uh, the normal week, you should be paid time and a half or some of a form of overtime. Lots of you also um, know about statutory holiday pay, Right. All of these things um, over time, et cetera, are actually laid out by law um, in Ontario uh, under a law called the Employment Standards Act. So uh, if you want to look up what the basic working conditions in Ontario, the ones that are laid out by law, look up the Employment Standards Act. Hours are another really important working condition. So do you have enough hours? Right. Uh, 
are they flexible? So if you have children or an interesting commute, etc., um, is your boss willing to be a bit flexible about your hours? And do you have some say in your hours? Do you have some kind of voice in scheduling? Breaks are really important. Um, in the Employment Standards Act, everybody is entitled to a meal break in their eight hour shift, right? Sick days are very, very important, especially these days. Right now, um, the NDP is pushing hard to try and get everybody in Canada 10 paid sick days, and ideally without a doctor's note. Um, that just makes sense in the time of COVID, frankly. Um, and vacations is the other kind of break that's very important. So um, in the Employment Standards Act, uh, there are rules around how much vacation um, employees have to be given uh, after a certain number of years at a job. Okay, so does your job include vacations? Health and safety is very important. We're going to talk about Wobbly's health and safety in just a sec. Um, so is your uh, work environment healthy and safe? Um, are you trained to use the equipment? Uh, are you trained to use any chemicals? Um, are, uh, have you been trained to use them safely? And do you have a voice in health and safety on your job? So um, the Occupational Health and Safety Act is the law in Ontario that lays out um, the rules, uh, the legal rules around health and safety. And one of them is, is that uh, workplaces are supposed to have a joint health and safety committee. And by joint, what they mean is some of the the management on it um, but also some of the workers on that committee and that's about a voice in health and safety whether or not you have benefits is an important uh, work condition right uh, do you have uh, a dental plan um, do you have coverage for things like uh, chiropractic uh, physiotherapy massage um, uh, and so on do you have a drug plan these are all important uh, working conditions pensions are an important working condition. These days, fewer and fewer workers have pensions, which is very worrying. Um, what are y'all gonna do when you get older if you don't have a pension? Job security is a very big working condition. It's a big concern these days because so many people work part-time. So if you're working part-time, you don't have much job security, right? If you go to a bank and you try and get a mortgage, they're gonna laugh at you. You have to have a full-time permanent position to be taken seriously um, around these kinds of things. And full-time permanent positions are uh, fewer and fewer and further between. So job security doesn't mean you can't be fired. Just about everybody can be fired. Right? But job security means that you are a permanent employee, you're a full-time employee, and you can expect to have a job next week, next month, next year. Okay. Respect and human rights. So being treated decently and not discriminated against. This is another working condition. Right? Um, having some kind of recourse and representation if or when you are disciplined on the job. This is also important. Um, this is one of the things that unions are really excellent for. So um, if, uh, if there's an attempt to discipline a worker in a unionized environment, that worker has representation through their union and through their union steward. Um, under Canadian law, the union is the worker's legal representative in conflicts with the boss, okay? Um, Professional development on opportunities for education is another working condition. All right, really good jobs include professional development. They include opportunities to educate yourself further so that you can be better at the job you have, but also so that you could get better jobs, which is the other working condition. Um, are there opportunities for advancement? Can you move forward and upward um, in the job that you have? All right, those are all um, important working conditions. Uh, I'm sure you guys could think of some more. Um, and if we were in the classroom, I would have had you brainstorm all of those, but uh, I haven't figured out how to do that online yet. Okay, so back to the blanket stiffs. So what were their working conditions? So you can see here, um, health and safety was just not even a thing, all right? It's almost laughable to think about um, health and safety around railroad work. Um, it was incredibly dangerous. Uh, I think Ross McCormick refers to it as carnage at one point. Um, so in three months during the winter of 1911, eight men were killed by dynamite on the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway line. Accident rates were incredibly high and bosses took pretty much no precautions. Um, the people who survived uh, the accidents and the railroad construction sites were often permanently maimed. And when we talk about Chinese workers next week, we'll talk about the incredibly high accident rate for Chinese workers. Um, historians estimate there's probably one Chinese railroad worker dead for every kilometer of railroad in Canada.
So in your reading on page 105, um, there's a poem written by a blanket stiff. He says, the life that God created is mangled, torn, and hurt by those who in their greed have rated humanity to be as cheap as dirt. And ever the ones who are toiling die hard for the ones that rest, the victims of a hellish spoiling of a system that stands accursed. Right? So those who in their greed have rated humanity to be as cheap as dirt include the bosses and the politicians, right? And ever the ones who are toiling, that's the workers, die hard for the ones that rest, that's the bosses, the politicians, the non-workers, the victims of a hellish spoiling of a system that stands accursed. So the worker here isn't just talking about the padrone system or the employment agent system or the railroad construction system. The worker here is talking about capitalism as a system that allows bosses to not care what happens to workers, that uh, rates workers' lives to be not worth very much. Um, and you can see a bunch of that going on right now in the ways that um, everyone is so concerned about the economy and especially in the US, much less concerned about the loss of human life, right? Uh, so the capitalism is still doing the same thing. Um, so because of the inflexible government schedules that contractors had to meet uh, if they wanted to profit, uh, the work environments in railroad camps were very authoritarian. Um, they were uh, very top down, right? The padrone system was generally used to keep Italian workers disciplined. Um, but many of the Eastern European immigrants were fresh off the farm. They were rural peasants. Um, they didn't understand the work habits of industrialization. Um, and because they ha were living in these like little work camps in the middle of the woods, um, they basically had no chance to learn North American norms of job discipline. Um, Foreman relied on racist stereotypes of uh, Eastern Europeans as stupid um, and used physical coercion and corporal punishment, um, that means hitting, um, to drive these workers. One foreman bragged, I kept them in their place with my bare fists and not a man among them even raised a shovel against me. An English immigrant wrote home to say the blanket stiffs were absolutely driven as slaves never were. At many jobs, a man cannot keep up the pace for many days. Directly he slackens, he is canned. Right, so um, the work was exhausting. It was physically grueling. Um, and if the men tried to rest, they often lost their jobs. Um, foremen beat up their workers and assault cases were often brought against foremen and occasionally even murder charges. This is a, a gentleman working a coal seam in a coal mine. Um, and I wanted to show you this picture because in the movies, um, mines are always places where people stand up. Um, and that is not actually what a lot of Canadian um, early mines looked like. Uh, this is uh, what is called a gopher hole. So this gentleman would work the entire day um, in this little tiny cave. Um, think about that. So uh, think about what it does to your body to be sort of bent over and stooped like that, especially if you're hefting uh, a heavy tool like this pick. Um, you'll notice also on the, the left of the image um, that the roof of the cave is being held up um, by uh, a piece of wood um, balanced on some rocks with uh, another piece of wood balanced on top of it. Um, that would not meet health and safety standards today by any stretch of the imagination. Um, if this gentleman hits the wrong rock with his pick, the whole thing will cave in um, and he is never going to see his family again. How did workers deal with these horrible conditions? Well, much the way that workers in hospitality and service sector deal with problems on their jobs, right? They leave, all right, they quit. Um, they run away. So um, most blanket stiffs ran away from the dangerous jobs. Uh, McCormick quotes one saying, lately I've seen so many blown into pieces that I got afraid and quit railroad work for good. The blanket stiffs also responded to these um, foremen uh, who were hitting and hurting people um, by fleeing their jobs. This strategy was called job jumping and it disrupted railroad work. It meant local labor shortages when accident rates were particularly high. So if you saw six guys get blown up in your work crew, um, you might decide that you liked life and wanted to see your family again and didn't need your wages very much and uh, hop on a, a boxcar and get out of that area.
So this left bosses without enough workers. To keep 2,800 men working, a contractor might have to hire more than 5,000 in a month. The companies offered bonuses to the workers who stayed a full season, but those bonuses were seldom collected. The companies used things like debt at the company store, expensive railroad tickets, and they would buy off police and magistrates to try and stop the workers from leaving their jobs. So when five Grand Trunk Pacific workers tried to quit in Alberta, they were arrested by the Mounties for breaking the Master and Servants Act and sentenced to a month's hard labor. The Masters and Servants Act uh, is actually a law that Canada inherited from Britain um, and it makes it illegal uh, to quit your job. It's called absconding. Um, it was only enforced, I believe, until 1782, so I don't know what they were doing enforcing it around 1900. Um, a contractor on the isolated Northern Ontario Railway, he actually kept uh, armed guards and a jail where he imprisoned workers who tried to flee. Um, none of this eliminated job jumping. Men still left the jobs because they did not want to die. Um, and most workers only stayed on jobs long enough to buy their ticket to another place. This uh, is Cumberland, BC again, only this is the mine, okay? So uh, I wanted to show you this image because yet again, look at this gorgeous, huge wood trestle. So this is all built by hand, right? Um, this is the mine shaft. So that little hut there uh, you, has an elevator that goes down into the mine, right? It's the mine shaft. And uh, you, I wanted to show you this partly to give you a sense of the size of things, right? So again, you can tell it's BC because of these ginormous trees, right? Um, but, uh, but also you can see a number of people here. There's even some women in this image, right? So you can see how big um, the mine shaft is. You can see how big um, the uh, construction project is building this, uh, this mine shaft would have been, okay? So never mind all the work down below in the mine. So blanket stiffs had sort of a seasonal cycle, right? Uh, so in spring, uh, they would move uh, out onto construction, usually railroad construction. Uh, they'd work on construction throughout the summer. But in early autumn, often blanket stiffs moved on to do harvest work because farmers often paid a lot better than the railroad. Um, and in the winter, many of them uh, moved out west to BC, Washington, Oregon, right, where it was milder um, and there was still forestry work going on. Um, the folks who were unemployed after the harvest or after railway work flooded into Canadian cities. Winter was long and hard, as it still is generally, um, and businesses like boarding houses, steam baths, brothels, and cut rate and secondhand clothing stores were briefly busy when the workers arrived in the city before they ran out of money. Most cities where these itinerant workers, where the blanket stiffs spent their winters, provided some services for those workers and something they called relief work. Um, we call it work fair these days. So it was like poorly paid municipal work. So maintaining roads, um, you know, trimming trees, cutting grass, um, uh, shoveling snow, uh, etc. Because uh, if the cities did not provide some kind of relief um, and, uh, and relief work for the blanket stiffs, um, the blanket stiffs were likely to protest until such services were provided. So in Montreal, there were protests in 1904, in Winnipeg, 1908, in Vancouver in 1912, and in Edmonton, 1914. Many of the unemployed, because there's no such thing as unemployment insurance back then, there's no social assistance back then, right? Um, they turned to charity, the churches, um, or begging. Right? And in spring, hunger forced these workers back onto railroad construction camps um, and other jobs. So the last little bit uh, of the questions in the reading uh, talks mostly about the union. The union was called the Industrial Workers of the World, and this union is still alive um, today. Um, it's smaller than it was then, um, but it still has basically the same principles. So. Um, uh, if you are a member of a union or if anyone in your family is a member of a union, you might have a union membership card. And these days they look, uh, they're like the same size as your driver's license or credit card, right? But back then union membership cards kind of look like little passports. So you've got a picture of a couple of them here, right? Um, so the United Mine Workers of America. So again, that's a Cumberland uh, mine uh, union. All right. And then here you've got the Relief Project Workers Union. Okay, um, so 
The Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, the, the nickname for the IWW was the Wobblies. All right, They were something called an industrial union. And this was a new kind of union um, that hoped to unite all workers to mount a challenge to the capitalist system that treated workers so badly. Okay, so I want to take a second here just to talk about the two different kinds of unions um, in Canadian history. So uh, there are two different kinds of unions. One is craft workers unions or craft unions, and the other is industrial unions, right? So craft unions are uh, come basically out of a tradition that was um, uh, a long held tradition in Europe where craft workers, skilled workers, would form something called guilds. All right. So if you were a shoemaker um, or a barrel maker or uh, a carriage maker, um, you were a skilled worker. Right. You knew how to make a shoe from start to finish. You knew how to make a barrel out of different materials to hold different kinds of things. Um, you know how to build carriages for um, rich ladies and carriages for farmers, etc. So these were skills. Right. And um, they generally ran in families and were handed down through the family, um, although you could um, apprentice with a, a skilled carriage maker um, if uh, you could talk him into taking you on as an apprentice um, and become a skilled carriage maker. Basically apprentices were servants um, until they acquired the necessary skills to be a skilled worker. All right. So these skilled workers formed guilds in Europe um, and uh, and these guilds were sort of the earliest form of unions. So um, if you were in the carriage makers guild um, and uh, and let's say the, the breadwinner was injured, say a carriage fell on him, all right? So the carriage maker is injured. Um, his family um, is now without a, a source of income. So all the other carriage makers in the guild would give a little bit of money and that money would be pooled and given to the family of the carriage maker who was killed. Um, guilds also represented the carriage makers um, or whatever other trade it was um, to local politicians. Um, they marched uh, in parades together. Um, they sort of, you know, were proud carriage makers, uh, etc. And this tradition became craft unions. So craft unions in Canada and the United States and across Europe um, were basically voluntary organizations that all of the skilled workers would belong to. They would pay dues um, and then the craft union would represent those workers to politicians, um, to bosses, uh, etc. Now, but craft unions were kind of exclusive organizations. In Canada, um, they were almost entirely British and white men. So again, white here would be French, Scandinavian, and British, right? Um, and uh, they wouldn't let other people into them often, right? Um, and they only took care of skilled workers. So you'll remember that the, the blanket stiffs, they're unskilled workers, right? They don't have skills. They're just manual laborers, right? So until the industrial unions were formed, um, around the mid 1800s they began to form, um, there were no unions for unskilled workers. So the Wobblies, the IWW, was an industrial union. It was a union for unskilled workers, okay? Onwards. The IWW had a unique membership structure and organized in very particular ways. So organizing is um, the bringing people together that unions do. So the IWW was set up to overcome the difficulties of organizing workers who move around. I've worked on union organizing campaigns and they're a lot easier to do uh, if all the workers are in one spot, all right? Because then you can find them, you can talk to them, etc. So Wobblies, the unionists, were blanket stiffs. So they were just the workers, all right? And they would go around talking to their fellow workers about changing capitalism, about all workers coming together and running things themselves, okay? Any Wobbly could sign up any other worker to be a member of the industrial workers of the world, all right? It was easy to join the union. The initiation fee was very low and the dues were low. Right. So this is how unions run is workers pay dues and that gives the union money to run its affairs. OK, so the initiation fee would have been, I don't know, 25 cents and the dues would have been maybe a dime every week or something. OK, now my union membership uh, is only for George Brown College. OK, but the IWW union memberships were transferable, so they applied in any workplace. Okay. 
The Wobblies had union halls in the cities and frontier towns where their members worked. Okay, and the union halls were basically like a community center. They were a place that workers could stay, a place they could receive their mail, um, and they were also sort of hiring halls. They often had job information um, and access to jobs. The halls functioned as social centers. The workers, when they weren't working, could hang out there, they could talk, they always had libraries so they could read the books. Um, often the Wobbly Halls um, got newspapers from around the world, so if you were from Russia, you might be able to find a Russian newspaper um, at the Wobbly Hall. And there were often um, sort of worker-to-worker -worker education, so um, uh, workers who uh, spoke uh, various language would give lectures, um, workers who could read and write in English, would help teach other workers how to read and write in English. Um, and there were lectures given on special topics, right, to just educate the workers generally. Um, one of the great things about the industrial workers of the world is they didn't have membership criteria. There was no one who they said could not join the union except basically bosses, all right? So they organized, meaning they built unions with um, cooks and waiters, with uh, train workers, workers on the Canadian Pacific Railroad, loggers, teamsters, those guys who drove the, the uh, horse carriages, street maintenance workers, and even newspaper boys. So um, before we had uh, CAS, uh, the Children's Aid Society, um, many children worked, right? Um, so uh, children would often work in factories with their parents, um, and uh, many young boys uh, were either shoeshine boys or newspaper boys. Um, if you're curious about this, there's actually a Disney movie, The Newsies, um, about this that uh, it gives a fictionalized, but it's also an interesting account. Um, in 1912, uh, 5,000 Wobbly members made up 12 Wobbly locals, so locals are like the chapters of something. All right, so at George Brown, um, we have uh, two union locals, one for all of the faculty uh, and one for all of the support staff, right? Um, and then Humber College has its own two locals for the faculty and for the support staff. Um, and we all belong to the same union, um, but we're in different locals, okay? So uh, the 5,000 members in 1912 made up 12 different locals between Winnipeg and Victoria, and nearly 40% of the railroad construction workers in the West belong to the Union. That's actually remarkable, given that those workers spoke a whole bunch of different languages and were constantly moving. Um, I wanted to show you an image of um, the labor organizing among Chinese workers. All right, so this is a picture of Chinese workers in British Columbia. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about Chinese workers next week. I just wanted to make sure we didn't leave them out of our discussion this week. Um, and this picture is a little more contemporary than the period we're actually talking about today. So what were the demands? So unions form because workers want something from their bosses, usually because workers are being treated very badly um, and what they want is better treatment. So what did they want? What were the demands of the industrial workers of the world? So above all, the IWW wanted to challenge capitalism. All right, It wanted a system that is better all right, and particularly better for workers. Um, but you can't, uh, you can't sell membership in an organization uh, on a dream. Okay, so they also worked to improve the immediate conditions, the right now problems of the, the Wobbly members. The union demands focused on some of the things that were real problems for these workers. It focused on trying to stop the, the extortion and the defrauding by employment agents. It focused on trying to uh, stop the overwork and uh, underpay of the workers. It tried to get them good accommodations. It tried to set up um, medical services for the workers so that um, if something happened on the job, uh, there was a doctor or nurse you could go to, right? Maybe less chance of losing your arm or your leg then. So this is uh, a quote from uh, a wobbly pamphlet. The IWW will take the blanket off your back, Mr. Blanket Stiff. It will make the boss furnish the blankets. And further, not only the blankets, but springs and mattresses. Yes, and as we go str grow stronger, sheets and pillows. Just imagine yourself in camp, snoozing away, tucked between nice clean sheets with your head resting on a feather pillow and a good mattress and springs under you. So you can see in that the union is appealing to what the workers want and need, right? So think about working a really heavy physical job all day and then having to sleep on uncomfortable hay in a bunk bed, 
right? So the idea of a decent bed must have been heaven to these workers. Ross McCormick says that the most revolutionary part of the Wobblies platform and probably their most important asset um, was that they were wanting to organize all immigrant groups. So again, this is a quote from a Wobbly pamphlet. When the factory whistle blows, it does not call us to work as Irishmen, Germans, Americans, Russians, Greeks, Poles, and Negroes or Mexicans. It calls us to work as wage workers, and regardless of the country in which we were born or the color of our skins, why not get together then as wage workers, just as we are compelled to do on the job? So the wobbly written materials were in at least 10 different languages. The rallies often involved speakers in many different languages and translation. The IWW workers could organize themselves into locals by ethnicity, so you could have an Italian local, or across ethnic lines, right? So you could have a local that was just this construction site. The first wobbly strike in Western Canada involved people from 18 different nationalities. Right? Not such a big deal today, but it was a big deal back then. So here we have um, some wobblies being arrested uh, at a free speech rally. So there's a bit of irony in that. I hope you can see. Um, in 1911, the uh, industrial workers of the world uh, unionized uh, Canadian National Railroad workers right, and um, tried to have a strike. So when uh, the IWW uh, organized uh, the Canadian National Railroad construction workers in 1911, contractors, the bosses, uh, pulled out all the stops. They disrupted wobbly meetings. They sicked the provincial police on the organizers of the union. They hired Pinkerton security agents to pretend to be workers and go to the union meetings and spy on the union. But these dirty tactics only led more men to join the union. The men involved in this, the largest IWW strike in Canada, managed to stop work over 300 miles of the Canadian National Railroad line in order to prote protest the conditions in their work camps. There were approximately 7,000 strikers and they were almost all new immigrants. Most of them were Eastern Europeans and Scandinavians. One strike leader said that the workers understood that there are only two nationalities and that these nationalities are divided by class and not by geographical lines. The Wobblies uh, established several camps in the strike zone because they got kicked out of the work camps, right? Because they were on strike. Um, so at the camp near Yale, so the Yale camp, um, they provided food and lodging for more than 500 men. The strikers spent their time when they weren't picketing, listening to lectures, debating industrial unionism, and singing revolutionary songs. The uh, Wobblies had a whole bunch of excellent songs. Because um, remember back then, you don't have internet, right? Um, and even, not even, uh, uh, most people couldn't access radio either, right? So um, the revolutionary songs were one of the ways of communicating the Wobbly message. Um, the IWW worked hard to keep the strike nonviolent. The Canadian government, however, played dirty. They changed the immigration rules so that contractors could bring in strike breakers. And the BC government advised the companies to hire private detectives to guard the strike breakers. So strike breakers, also called scabs, uh, are people who come in and do the work that's not being done because people are on strike, right? And the only power that a strike has is to try and get the boss to deal with them because the work isn't getting done. So if strike breakers are doing the work, the strike loses all its power. So between these measures, the Canadian government and the BC government, um, and ethnic conflicts between the replacement workers, the strike breakers, and the striking workers, so most of the strike breakers were Italian, um, it became impossible for the union leadership to keep everything peaceful. So pressured by businessmen and by racism um, in British Columbia, um, the BC government launched a full-scale campaign to end the strike. Health inspectors who had allowed the contractors to have completely unsafe and unhealthy um, work camps tried to close down the wobbly strike camps. By the third week of April, the cops had begun or ordering the strikers back to work. And if the strikers refused, they'd tear down the, the union camps, close the union halls, and drive the men out of the strike zone or arrest them. 250 wobblies were in jail by June as the British Columbia government tried to deport others. 